So this talk started um, because I have taken a hiatus from the uh, corporate grind that, that he was talking about, uh, the starting companies and getting acquired and all of that fun stuff, and decided what I want to, and trying to decide what I want to do next. And while I was doing that, I started talking with a bunch of entrepreneurs like yourself. And I was uh, surprised when I would go back a month later and they would say, we did what you said. And I'd look at it. I go, that wasn't what I said, right? But that wasn't a bad thing. So that's not, that's not, I didn't look at it and say, wow, you did it wrong. There were just times that I was like, wow, that wasn't what I said. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> and, and again, it just started happening so many times and I thought, I know I'm not that bad of a communicator from my experience, so there's something happening with our listening. So Alistair wrote me and he said, hey, you know, I'd love to have you at Startup Fest this year. What do you want to speak on? And I said, well, here's a whole bunch of things. I normally speak on innovation. I speak about customer-driven design, all that kind of stuff. I said, but what I'm really passionate right now about is listening and how hard it is. And so Alistair said, I'm totally up for doing something new. So you guys are getting the worldwide premiere of my new talk, Listening is Hard. But so you know, it's actually been just as I've told friends and all of that, it's been talked about. I'm, I'm giving this about four more times now already this year. So you're the first, but there's going to be more. So hopefully we'll spread this uh, idea of listening around. Woo. All right. So you guys may have already seen this um, little cartoon that we start with. It doesn't really matter if you can't read it, but the whole idea is what the customer described, and it ends up being different from what the engineer uh, delivered that was different from how support could uh, do it. And at all of those stages, as we've all been through, right, it ends up being likely a listening problem. People didn't hear and understand what was being told to them, so how can we do that better? So I'm going to give you some tips on that. Oh, I'm Jana. These are my uh, coordinates, Jana at janaggers.com. If you know my name, you can always get in touch with me. And I'm Jeggers on uh, Twitter. So feel free to get in touch with me. Give me your stories about listening, but also any questions that you have. I'm happy to talk about it. It's important to know uh, who's speaking for you to understand better. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was a mathematician, but I was raised by a banker. So uh, I three cartoons that explain me. So I'm not Einstein, but uh, he was a famous physicist, although that's based in mathematics, as we mathematicians always say. So, um, but I found that this says Einstein discovers time is actually money. Well, that's what my dad was always telling me when I was growing up, that, you know, it's all about the money. It's the, it, as a banker, I had a, I had a uh, checkbook when I was nine years old. My friends thought it was really cool. For me, it was a task because I had to sit down with my father every month and go through and balance my check, balance the checkbook so he could teach me those things about how, how accounting actually worked. Well, then, accidentally, I did, I was a research scientist, as I said, I was out at Los Alamos, I did computational chemistry work, and I ended up leaving that because I was raised by that banker, and I went to a startup. Well, I had no idea that was a crazy thing to do. I was just like, I don't know, these people are doing cool stuff, and it's similar to what I was doing out at Los Alamos, I call it my halfway house, but... I went into a startup, and then that's when I learned it is a crazy thing to do. It's crazy fun, but it's also crazy hard, as you've heard a lot of times. So, you know, this is my little joke about that is uh, what's the, you know, biggest problem with a startup? It's the starting up. And then uh, lastly, I got obsessed with the customer, and that really happened at that first startup. Um, I didn't have a customer when I was a research scientist. Uh, I was studying computational chemistry. I was doing conducting polymers. So the only thing that we made was film, right? And just how and watched how it would conduct there. So there wasn't a real customer there. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. There are people that are using my software. And so I just went out and started talking to them. And the folks that I was working with, they, it was a bunch of MIT and, and Stanford guys. And they were like, why are you talking to our customers? 
you don't need to do that. We already know. We're telling them what to do with our software. And I was like, yeah, but I want to see them actually use it. I want to learn, like, what is it about it? And I learned that was something that gave me the most energy. So, so you know, my background is in math and science, and my passion is that customer side. So this listening is absolutely key on the customer and that discovery side of what they actually really need versus what they actually say versus what we actually interpret and implement. So let me back up for a second and tell you how bad our listening problem is. So it, anybody here read Made to Stick? Yeah, we've got a few people. So Made to Stick is all about how to get your message across. It's a great book. Chip and Dan Heath, they're terrific people. Um, and that in, in that book, they talked about a um, PhD thesis at, at Stanford that was um, how people uh, get their point across. And, and, and it was done with a tap, it was part of the um, PhD thesis, but it was a tapping exercise that they did in it. So those people who have read the book will remember it. What they did is they had tappers and listeners, and the tappers would tap out a very well known song, you know, Happy Birthday, O Canada, um, you know, uh, uh, Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star. And then the listeners would have to guess what it was. Well, the point of the, the work was that the tapper, the people that were tapping would guess that people would guess what song they were tapping because it was so clear 50% of the time. They're like, I know it's only tapping, but absolutely they're going to guess that I tapped out happy birthday 50% of the time. They'll get it. What actually happened is the listeners got it 2.5% of the time right? 20x difference between, and their point was, the speaker believes, right? And that, that it, they're understood. And their reason that they found this, that they came up with in this thesis is because the tapper actually had all of that music playing in the background, right? So they're tapping it out. And when they're tapping it out, they're actually singing the words, the song to it and everything. Now, the challenge is that when we go into a customer, what happens? Our customer is tapping out a song for us, and in their mind, it makes a lot of sense. But here's the problem. You, you know how hard it is to come up with another song when you've got a song in your head. You have a song in your head, right? That song is your solution. So your customer is sitting there ta you know, tapping out. Well, you're, you're sitting there listening with the We Are the Champions song in your head, right? Because you're so excited about your idea. You're passionate about it. You're like, we are the champions. And what's happening is your customers crush there singing, you're killing me softly, right? So, so you've got this disconnect there because you're going in with the full bore with an idea and they're tapping out something different that you can't even hear. So if you, if, you know, the numbers, the actual numbers, like I said, are 2.5% on the, on the ta listeners. There's other research that will show you, you tomorrow, you will only remember, well, within 48 hours, day after tomorrow, you're only going to remember 25% of what I said. So if you combine these kinds of things, you're talking about, and this is adding my estimate, right? Because the tappers and the listeners there really didn't have context that we can have when we go into our customers. I'd say that we get about 5 to 10% right. And I was doing that research. And then I remembered this other research that uh, has been happening over the last few years, which is the Startup Genome Project. And they have found that um, it's about 92% of startups fail. 92% of technology startups fail. By the way, we suck compared to the rest of the world because it's about it. Not, not the rest of the world is in tech startups, but the rest of the world is of startups. Uh, they fail at about 50% rate. So the, the average rate for the failure of a company that starts up within four years is 50%. Um, we as a technology industry are at about 92%. Pretty strong numbers there. The interesting things with the genome product is they, project is they actually went in and said, why do startups fail? They fail because they try to scale too prematurely. And if you know, and, and if you're looking at, for you, it's the right-hand side. Um, if you look at it, what's, what they're talking about is they don't spend enough time in the discovery, the validation, and the efficiency phase, and they go too fast to scale, right? We get our VCs in here. I'm sorry to all the VCs that are here. I love you, I do. But there's often that push 
from that side, we put the money in, we gave you a lot of money, why don't you scale? And you'll actually see that if you want to go read, that's why I put the uh, URL in there. If you go and read the report, the people who scaled, that 74% that's uh, failed from scaling too fast, they actually had more money. So um, listening is really key for discovery, and that's where I'm going to focus today. It's also key for validation and for efficiency because obviously if you're going in and you're cutting out things that aren't important, you want to make sure you cut the right things. You need to understand which ones those are. What I'm going to focus on today, though, is those customer visits because I love them and really uh, give you some tools for when I'm going into discovery, which discovery is figuring out, you know, is there a real problem here to solve? Before I decide if my solution fits, which is the validation side, it's what is that real problem. So that, that's what I want to talk about and focus on today. Um, I also know that the threat of death isn't going to inspire you to change. Um, you can read, there's all kinds of research on that. People will choose to die like these companies did rather than change. What, I want, what has been proven in, in uh, research is people will change for a better life. So I'm giving you, I'm just listing out a few bits of research here for you about why your life is going to be better. It is going to improve sales. It's going to improve your relationships with your uh, customers. It's going to improve your relationships with your employees if you improve your listening skills. So you will have a better life if you listen better. In addition to that, you need to be sure that you can. So some people will say, well, I'm not totally sure that I, that I can listen better. Um, listening is a skill just like anything else. It's not something that you just inherently have or you don't have. Just like with these visual tools, you, once you saw the other way of looking at this visual tool, right, you can't not see it. You can't not see the vase or the two faces in the uh, one. You can't see the man or the girl. You can't not see those. So listening is exactly that same way. And I'm going to show you. I, hopefully the um, audio will work. Are we good? We're going to bring up a website to show you exactly the same thing with listening as you have with this visual clue. Here is a sentence, a spoken sentence, that's been transformed by a computer to sound like gibberish. So, <laughs> any idea what they said? No. Okay. Uh, we can hear it one more time. <laughs> okay, now we'll hear the real sentence. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. The Constitution Center is at the next stop. Does it make sense that time? Yeah, wait, was that the same? It was the exact same sentence that you heard the first time. No way. <laughs> It's the exact same sentence. Your brain is always using prior information to make sense of new information coming in. So once you know what the sentence is, when you go back and hear the distorted version, you can apply that information and it makes sense. It's pretty cool. So, so you guys, it's just getting that right context, right? It doesn't mean that you have to know that exact sentence but you need to set your stage so that you can listen and hear better. So let's talk about that. So let's build, build some ear muscle. This is actually a, an Olympic, a, a, an Eskimo National Olympic Championship. Um, I just liked your face. So before your visit, so remember, we're talking about going to visit customers, right, and learning from them. So what can you do before your visit? So I'm going to start this one with a, uh, with a, a personal story. So um, I think, I didn't mention it, but I was at Intuit. Intuit bought a company that um, I had founded with some friends, and um, I didn't join them because I was like, no, that's a big evil company. I didn't think they were actually evil, but that's a big company, and all big companies are evil, therefore. And uh, I went and did another startup, and they came back and recruited me to found their corporate innovation lab. And I, I, I did that um, because, for one, I'll be honest, it's flattering when Scott Cook himself calls you and asks you to come do something like that. Um, and he, they were very nice to say that they would do it my way. And um, we started that journey. And so as we did, one day I was in Scott's office, and he said, you know, Jana, you're really good at this, going out to customers and listening to them, and you bring up different insights that, that other people don't do. Um, I've been thinking about it, and is it really something that we can um, teach 
or is it something that's just innate that we can't teach this, that you're just good at it and we got to go find more people like you? And I just looked at him a little shocked and I was like, whoa, I, I, that, I'm not sure about that because, wow, thanks for saying I'm good at this, but I just don't know the answer. And it's, it actually sent me on this whole soul searching thing. And I was like, okay, well, let's just assume that I'm good at it. And I appreciate that compliment. But why would that be? And one of the things that we used to say in the lab all the time was pretend you're from Missouri right? You're from the show me state. So you're at a customer's office and, you know, they say, well, I always do X and, you know, pull up this report. And that's the first thing that I do in the morning. And what uh, we would say is, well, tell them to show you. And you'll be very surprised at how often the customer will say, you know, I don't remember my password for that. Maybe I don't really do it every day. It's probably every week. But you know what? The, the, the woman in our office across the hallway, she does it every day. And then you go over to her, and she actually doesn't do it every day either. And then you end up talking to the uh, guy who owns the company, and he says... Yeah, I've been not wanting that report for a long time, and someone brings it up every six months, and I'm really tired of hearing about it. So what people say is not the same thing, which is why it's really important to say, show me. And um, what I really found out from that, so as I was going through this whole source searching, why am I good at that? And I was like, well, it's because I have these tools, and I have things like the show me thing. But what I really realized was a different thing, which is I have curiosity, and I'm actually from Arkansas, and Arkansas, if you don't know, because some people don't even know, well, because of Bill Clinton, people know now. I keep forgetting that thing. So Bill's from Arkansas, too. I'm from Arkansas. You, we are one of the worst states in education. You know, we always say, thank God for Mississippi, or otherwise we'd be number, number 50, okay? And we're usually 49. So I was lucky I got a good education, public school education, but it was because my parents were very involved and that got teachers involved as well. And one of the things that my parents did as I was growing up is they made it very clear to me, not in a mean way, but there were lots of other people that were smarter than me. Even though I did well in class and I was in the top of my class, which was great, they always made very sure that I understood I wasn't the smartest person around in the world. And they did it in a very supportive way and encouraging me to go out and do research. So, you know, when I was in high school, I was doing National Science Foundation research and nobody else in my classes were. But it was because my parents made sure that I understood that. And I think that's really what drove my curiosity. And I don't think that that's something that's innate. I think it's something I learned from my parents. And so that's the thing that I will tell you is that can be your secret weapon is your curiosity. And something that fuels curiosity is really going and learning. Who am I going to visit? I mean, I'm surprised at how many times when I'll go with people and I, I help people on customer visits and they haven't done any research at all about who they're going to visit, what the company does, who the people are, what organization, you know, like what are they trying to do in their organization? They know nothing. If you do just the basic research, you know, Google the person, find out a little bit about them, that's going to stir part of your curiosity like, ooh, wow, they used to do that and they're doing this. Why is that? It's going to put your mind in a different state than just, oh, I'm going out there to complete a customer visit and my customer's going to tell me what to do, right? So start, that's the first thing I'll say is start with a curious mind. The next thing, if we can get there, my exercise number two is you guys have all heard this, right? You have two ears, one mouth, use them in that percentage. I will say this is one of the biggest things. So um, when we were, it, again, at Intuit, that's, I've done, you know, 550 customer visits with small businesses there. So a lot of my experience comes from there. But one of the things that um, we noticed when we started going out with uh, the Intuit teams from the lab, the, the lab team started going out with the business unit teams is the business units were coming with a stack of questions. I mean, they would go into some of these customer visits with 110 questions and all they were doing were an in-person survey. And they were doing it so fast that they weren't even listening. They were just quickly writing down the answer, go to the next one. Quickly write down the answer, go to the next one. 
that's a really expensive way to get customer uh, survey done. So I don't recommend it. What I do recommend, and this is something that we instituted, is you have to go on customer visits for two or more hours. And in that two or more hours, you can ask three questions. Right, there's always follow-up, I don't mean that. But you can only have, when you're going into that, have three questions to ask. Think about what that does to your mind when you're doing that. You're trying to learn from customer, and I know you're anxious because you want to learn all these different things from your customer. It boils it up to a higher level, right? And it helps you learn more from your customer because you're not getting into those details and asking them which color of blue you should use right? You're getting up to the higher level of what's really important in figuring out what their problem is. So two hours, three questions, two ears, one mouth. Okay, so um, if any of you guys do the seven minute workout, people know the seven minute workout? Yeah, right. So what do you do the second time? In the second exercise, you have wall sits, right? And you just sit there like this. Well, I'm going to say, in this situation, you need to do car sets, okay? So you've just driven up in your car. Hopefully, you've used public transit or your bike. I'm not being that particular about it. But I want you to take a break and clear your mind before you go into that customer visit. So always plan to be there 10 to 15 minutes in advance, right? So you can take that breather. You're not thinking about that email that you left at work. You're not thinking about, oh, my gosh, I need to do the these five things, it's not your to-do list, hit the pause button. And I will tell you that this advice, more than any of the others I'm going to give you to you today, is the most important one. Because remember what I said about having that song in your head? This is going to be the time to clear the song out of your head. Please just sit there, hit pause, Clear your mind of everything, because the more you go in with an open mind, with that clear mind, the better you're going to do in listening to your customer. Okay. Exercise number four. How many of you guys know Humans of New York? Yeah? It's pretty cool. It's, it's one of my favorite little breaks in the day. Well, if you know, oh, this is where I screwed up my, so this is, I switched to do, do it during a visit, and I got the slides switched, so Sorry. But it goes to the next one anyway, which details how to do it. So um, Brandon did it great. It's online. Uh, the link's in the presentation, which I know you can't get. But if you just search for, you know, Humans of New York, Brandon, um, I think it was in Ireland. Uh, they, he went in and said, how does he actually get people in one of the least friendly cities in the world um, to let him take a picture and for since so many of you know it, you know how amazing it is, the stories that he gets people to tell. And this is, I'm giving you over two hours with customer, right? Brandon does this in about 15 minutes. And he gets people to tell him amazing stories about themselves, where they came from, what they did. And this was his, in, in the video, he didn't give four steps. I listened to it several times and tried to pull out what, what I heard and what I thought were the most important steps. And I thought his first one was so good, which is it's the energy that you go in with. You know, if you're sitting there and all you're doing is filling out an in-person survey, how does the person feel? They don't feel engaged. They're not going to tell you those, all of those little things that are important about your startup. They're just going to feel like, okay, I'm here to put, you know, money in a vending machine, right? I'm not engaging with this person. What's most important is to get them to engage. So he talks about, it isn't the words I say, it's this energy that I have. You know, I have this approachable energy. Again, you can get some of, the, of that from your, from your clearing your mind, the car sit, right? Where you're taking a break, start thinking about, okay, I'm relaxed now. Right? If you're anxious and nervous and thinking about all the things you have to do, they're going to feel that. Don't take that into your customer visit. Take that relaxed, open curiosity. That's that energy that he's talking about. Realize your approach. You're coming in knowing what you're trying to accomplish. They don't understand it. I can assure you that I went into so many customer visits where they thought we were coming there to do QuickBooks support. They thought we were coming in to do QuickBooks support, and we were coming in to learn about a completely new area that had nothing to do with QuickBooks. One of the ways that we found to do that was we would just say, you know what, 
If you have QuickBooks questions, we'll take those at the end. And what we did with that is we just took the questions and we developed a channel with support where we'd take the questions back from support. Someone from support would call them that day. So build your channels. Don't let that derail you and be comfortable with that. So go in, tell them, why are you doing this? Hey, we're here to learn from you. This is a new project. It isn't something that you have already. It isn't related to the product that you have already. Make sure that they understand what your approach is and what your goals are that you're trying to get accomplished. And then um, the last one that he said is broad questions escalating slowly. Why do you think I said only have three questions, right? It's those broad questions and then use those as taking off points. Okay, so number five is uh, pen beats keyboard. And I know this is really hard for us. And I used to have this question all the time. And I had no formal research to tell people as to why pen beats keyboard. I, my gut was that. Uh, but there's actually some new research. It came out in about April. And in that April research, uh, in that research that came out, they actually went in and they were focused on people's learning. And it was uh, at schools. And um, actually from TED Talks is the, is the biggest amount of research that they did. They'd have people um, watch these TED Talks and then they would test them on them. So they tested them both on uh, factual information and conceptual information. The people that took handwritten notes scored significantly higher every single test that they had. Every single test. So they thought that it was because um, what happens is when you're typing, you actually take, um, oh, take more um, verbatim notes. You get it exactly right. And so they thought, well, maybe it's because when you're handwriting, you have to summarize things, right? And they actually tested that. So they told people who were typing, they said, just summarize things, don't take verbatim notes. And they did that, they still tested worse, okay? They tested worse if they had the people review the verbatim uh, typewritten notes or, and the handwritten notes in advance. So even if you got study time in advance and you had the verbatim notes, you still did poor, more poorly. So there really is something, and there's actual studies that will tell you, and it has to do with how much you remember. It's just another sensory input. You're not just listening with your ears. You're also listening with your hand, and that sensory input actually helps you learn better. Um, the next thing is what I'll call the cheetah. So you, I can speak, well, probably not me because I'm from the south and we're slow, but people in general can speak at 125 words per minute. Your brains can speak, can understand at 400 words per minute, okay? So I'm speaking like Usain Bolt or probably someone a lot slower than him, and your mind's a cheetah, right? That's the difference. And you need to realize that, that what's happening is that's why your mind's wandering. It's actually not because you're bored. You could be quite interested, but you can't help it. You've got two thirds of your brain that's just sitting there. It's gonna go do bad things, right? <laughs> so you need to figure out how to be like a cheetah. And it's not just how to be fast, because the thing about a cheetah is it's wicked fast, but it, actually the reason why it's successful in the kill is that it's agile. So these are some tools to help you think, have your mind think like a cheetah, which is being agile. And the thing is, you play these games with yourself. You do things, and th this is actually proven, this, is, uh, this research is from Cornell, if I'm remembering correctly. And the thing that um, you want to do is anticipate what the person's going to say next. Right? You can look at their slides and anticipate what they're going to say next. It's a little thing to keep your brain engaged in the actual conversation that's being had. Identify their supporting points, right? You already just summarized in your handwritten notes. Identify, well, what were the points that they made that are supporting points? And again, it's ways of keeping your brain engaged, that other two-thirds of your brain that can go off and do bad things. It's ways of keeping your brain engaged in what they're saying. So think like a cheetah. Number seven is the boomerang, which is, our minds will always go off course. How do we bring them back? And there hasn't been a lot of research in listening for this, per se, but there has been a lot of how do we get attention back. A lot of it's been due to driving because people get really distracted in their driving. 
So one thing is make sure that you clear off distractions from your plate, okay? Meaning don't have a notebook that has all these sticky notes sticking out of it, right, that will distract you. Have some visual cues. This one was very interesting. This happened in driving. They said just tying a string around a steering wheel is something that will train drivers to be less distracted because they know as soon as they feel themselves get distracted, they go back to the string. They start training their mind and they go back faster. So maybe when you walk in and you see the customer visit, you see she's wearing some glasses on her, on her uh, t-shirt, maybe that's your cue, right? Pick a cue and go back to it. So that's why I'm talking about a boomerang. Think about coming back in these conversations playing a game, everybody's played the license plate game, you know, like let's name the license plate or number or alphabet on license plate. Those license plate games are good. So play buzzword bingo with your customer, right? You and your team are sitting there, pick out the buzzwords that the customers say. That's fine. Anything to get your brain engaged in the conversation that you're having, that's what you want to do. So think about the boomerang. So I'm not going to go through these, but we'll have them. I think the slides will be made available. That's just a summary of all of those. And I want to get some questions. But the two things I want to cover, because they're the number two questions that I always get about customer va visits, which is, how the hell do I find time to do this? Right? I will just tell you, this is just like software development. Fixing bugs in the design phase is a heck of a lot easier than fixing them after you've scaled. So all the time, I won't say all the time, a good amount of the time that you spend here, it's 150 times more to fix it in the production phase than it is in the design phase of software. It's the exact same thing here. So I'm going to give you back, for every hour you spend on this, I'm going to give you back 150 hours on the back end. That's how you find the time to do this. Second thing is how to find customers. This is Beer Garden in Berlin. I ran a German company for a while. We used to go to the Beer Garden. This Beer Garden, this exact picture, I would go sit there with a computer and show people what we were working on, talk to them about it, understand where they were coming from. Customers are everywhere. Do not get hung up in, I have to recruit someone to find customers. They are everywhere. And don't be shy about going. People love it. People are flattered that you want their information, that you want their attention, that you want their feedback. You're not asking them for marketing information, right? You're asking them to tell you what their experience is. And they love that, again, if you approach it with the right space. So... I want you guys to go off and set records in ear pulling. We've already known about truck pulling. Um, it was funny when that came up this morning because I was like, oh my gosh, that's in my slides. <laughs> but to do that, you may have some questions. I'm happy to be your coach. Um, I want to go pull a truck now in heels. <laughs> I'll do it in heels too. But I'm happy to do that. If you guys have, are there questions? Um, you didn't use the term customer development much at all, but that's obviously the hot term in lean startup. I'm just wondering if you feel like there's anything new that, like, you know, the Steve Blank stuff and the Eric Ries stuff has added to your thinking. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's, I, I, I'd say it's one of the, it's iterative development, right? You, you learn stuff as you go along. It's like, oh, I really like that. I like the approach. I'm a big fan of the lean um, work. So I, I recommend, you know, Alistair's book. I just recommended it yesterday. Um, Ash's book, which is running lean all the time. I, it's, so I think there's the lean UX book is terrific. So it's all the same stuff. It's, uh, I, what I love about what they've done is they've packaged it. So I don't have to go in and, you know, talk about it anymore and explain these concepts. I just go, there's that book right there, go read it. So this fits in exactly with what they're talking about. And it's, it's another step in the how um, of how to do what they want you to do. So thank you. Got another question. Yeah. Hold on, I'll give you the Thank mic. you. Second pity question. Uh, not a pity question at all. <laughs> it's, uh, um, you, you spoke about how there's a, essentially a delta between what people say they do and what they actually do. How often do you actually sit in your car and talk to someone. So uh, it, it's actually very interesting because there's two times we would sit in the car uh, and, and I do recommend it because uh, that difference is something hard to see and really understand. So the question was, in case everybody didn't um, hear it, uh, 
there's such a difference between what people say they do and what they actually do. And so how do you get to that? Are there some techniques there? And, and so I would say that that clearing of the mind helps because you, um, if you're kind of processing in a slower pace rather than a faster pace, you don't jump to conclusions. So that's one of the things that we do is we just assume people are right. So if you get in that curiosity space, you're going to ask them more. And, and we always did the ask why five times. So they'll say, you know, I do this. Well, why do you do that? So that's another technique for getting away from that. Sorry. Oh. And uh, sit in the car. That's all. Do you all, do you actually always do that, or is oh that no like, no the yeah. car sit is you alone before you yeah. go into the customer. How often do you do that? Oh me? Yeah. I do it all the time. I just did actually three this week because I'm researching a, a new idea that I may go and start myself. So this is something, and and honestly that that's a really uh, good question too because I was in um, I was in Palo Alto. Last week, wow, that was last week. Last week, and I hadn't organized anything at all, but I walked into this place, and I, from something that happened, I felt like they were a target for what I was thinking about, and I just asked. I was like, hey, is the manager or owner here? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, cool, would they talk to me? And they're like, why? And I said, ah, I just like to talk to people about their business and they said yes i mean it's amazing how often i'm just telling you it's amazing how often you can go to a beer garden and you can get 35 people to talk to you and you're not paying them anything you're not doing anything they're just they're fascinated when you approach it this way as you know hey i'm just trying to learn here i'm not trying to sell you anything i'm just trying to learn so we have time are, for one more oh we can do one more i thought yeah. i was getting cut no 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 one more Uh, could you talk a bit about the importance of uh, body language when you're trying to get people to open up? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And Brandon covers it in, the, um, in that video that I talked about. One of the things he says is he's kind of a tall guy, and he says he often kind of comes in and he tries to be low, and he says it's really awkward as he's coming in to talk to someone like, hey, can I take your picture? <laughs> right? But he actually pays attention to that. And he said it works better than just walking up to some, hey, can I take your picture? Because he's a tall guy. So he actually really pays attention to that. And I'd say it's, it's absolutely true. You know, look, when you're going in, if you're doing a customer visit, um, one of the things that I'd say, we, we often, when we do these customer visits, people would take us and put us in a conference room. Um, because they had room for all of us, because we'd often go with three people, and then if you have two or three from the customer, it gets kind of big. So they'd go, well, we have you in the conference room today. We have a computer in there. We'd always say, you know, I know it's going to be crowded, but can we go where you actually do your work? Because people perform differently when they're not actually doing their work there. So if it's an office environment like that, so that's a, it's, it's huge. And just the, the kind of openness, that's another thing that, the reason why, actually, the primary reason why I was always uncomfortable with the um, typing versus handwritten notes, and I didn't have the research proof for it, the typing was distracting to people, and I could see it. So you talked about body language. That was a body language. There's a screen here, and then there's this click, 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 click. And it really took away from the customer visits. And you could see people as they're talking, they would kind of turn and they'd hear it every now and then. So that the environment is really important. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.